Hello everyone, so in today's video we'll be talking about this. This is the shunt regulator for our headphone amplifier project. Um, this is uh, the prototype circuit. And this might change in the, the final iteration of the PCB. So I've also made a little uh, prototype PCB, as you can see. In this episode, we are going to be talking about how you are going, how you uh, come about to design something like this. We are going to be uh, explaining all the building blocks of uh, a discrete regulator like this. We'll be demystifying this sort of stuff. Then later, we'll be doing some experiments on uh, on uh, this circuit right here, to see how it performs. And uh, yeah, so it's going to be a, a maybe a, a bit of a, a long one <laughs> for this. But uh, before you start doing any work, uh, designing any sort of regulator, the first thing that you got to do is uh, determine two things. First of all, the output voltage, which is going to determine your input voltage and all the other stuff, and also your current. So to do that, we shouldn't focus on this, but then we should focus on the circuit that this will be powering. In the final uh, iteration, uh, what we'll be doing is we'll have a, basically a dual mono setup. So we will have a, a power supply for each uh, amplifier section, for each uh, um, channel, okay? So we're going to be designing basically for uh, just one channel each, okay? So now let's take a look at the circuit that this will be powering and to determine um, all the other variables, okay? So since the beginning, We've always been designing with a 12-volt uh, circuit in mind, a single supply 12-volt circuit. So we don't have to uh, care about having a negative rail. So the output voltage of our um, regulator should be at around 12 volts. This value, it's not absolute. You don't need to have exactly 12 volts. So there is some leeway there. Okay. But most importantly, we need to know uh, the amount of current that will be passing through the supply. Um, let's disregard this LED here, since uh, that will most likely change, and it won't be uh, one LED per uh, uh, amplified circuit, so let's just disregard that. But, so here we have 2 milliamps flowing through the uh, pre-amplified stage. And uh, in this final stage right here, in this... Uh, Current sync, by the way, if you want to know more about uh, this circuit, there is a video on it with the uh, where I talk about this in uh, great detail. Uh, there's also all sorts of circuits, uh, all sorts of videos on each of these circuits, so of current sources, sinks, and stuff like that. So check those out. But uh, uh, here it's just two milliamps flowing through this uh, current source, and it, this current sink is sinking around uh, 65 milliamps. Okay, so. In idle, this circuit is going to be uh, drawing, let's say, uh, 70 milliamps. So our idle will be at uh, 70 milliamps. Um, this is important because this is going to be the current that will be being drawn always from the power supply. So the power supply should always be capable of delivering this current continuously without overheating, going into any sort of a uh, uh, fault mode, okay. But there's one thing: this is a dynamic circuit. This is, isn't going to be a, always at idle. And uh, since we've designed this for the, you always have to design for the worst case scenario. We've designed this for a 50 ohm um, load. If you have one of those uh, weird <laughs> low impedance headphones, okay. So it's a 16 ohm load. And uh, if we have a 16 ohm pair of headphones here at the output, and uh, this circuit uh, is going to be providing, let's say, a one volt peak to peak signal into this sort of load, which is uh, plenty for it uh, at those levels, you're already getting uh, a bit of a hearing damage. So, but again, worst case scenario. So this 16 ohm load with a one volt peak to peak signal, that means that the peak of the sine wave will be at around uh, um, 500 millivolts. So 500 millivolts over the 16 ohms gives us a current of around 30 milliamps, okay? So this circuit at idle, it's drawing, let's say, uh, uh, 70 milliamps. But in the peak of the sine wave, 
this circuit will be drawing around 100 milliamps. So I max, our maximum current that will be drawn will be around 100 milliamps. Okay. And uh, the way that this works is simple. This circuit's always syncing that to uh, 65 milliamps, but this circuit right here is basically acting as a uh, source, a current source. So this is just providing that extra 30 milliamps to flow through the load right here. That's how you get uh, uh, a voltage here. Okay. And uh, when the circuit's going to the, it's into its uh, negative region, the, all that it, this is doing is it's providing less than this uh, 65 milliamps in order for this to uh, discharge these, the, this capacitor here. So the current flows from the load through here to ground. Okay. So that's pretty simple. So we need a, a, a power supply. We need to design a power supply. In this case, we've decided for going with a shunt supply. That is capable of providing us 12 volts, uh, should be capable of delivering 70 milliamps continuously, non-stop, but it should be capable of delivering 100 uh, milliamps. Remember, this is not a, a transient uh, current. Uh, usually transient currents you deal, by, uh, you deal with by uh, adding uh, decoupling like this which means that if you've got a sharp uh, transient, this capacitor is what's going to uh, provide the current needed for that. In this case, it actually needs to provide that 100 milliamps, okay? So our circuit must be capable of delivering this, right? So now let's go back to the um, regulator and I'm going to explain how you design it and how that's, that part of it is done, okay? So let's take a look here. So this circuit might look a bit daunting at first sight, but so was the headphone amplifier, and we uh, explained that in great detail and became a uh, fairly simple. First thing that you got to do as soon as you see some uh, discrete circuitry like this that looks uh, <laughs> like you can't understand it. First, think about the theory of operation. So in the previous video where we talked about the uh, regulator topologies, linear regulator topologies, we've discussed that a shunt regulator is nothing more than a constant current source okay, with a dynamic constant current sink with a load in parallel. So basically, our regulator is just this. It's just a current source uh, in series with a current sink. Our load's just going to be tapping off here in parallel, and this current sink will be modulating uh, uh, its uh, sinking so that uh, the current, the sum of these two currents is equal to the current source. Okay, so. That's the first thing that you gotta keep in mind. Then we went through uh, a little bit of an explanation going from a simple Zener regulator to a buffer Zener with a constant current source. Okay, so as you can see, we already have something that's familiar. Okay, now let's take a look at this. This is supposed to be an adjustable shunt regulator, that way we are not tied up by some uh, Zener voltage. We can just dial this down to uh, uh, very low voltages and just dial it up uh, to whatever voltage we want. So how does this work? As soon as you see a circuit like this, you gotta first identify some building blocks. That's the key uh, way to uh, understanding how any discrete circuit works and any circuit for that matter. So first of all, here you can see the typical uh, constant current source. So just grab this. Let me leave this in here. Leave it in front. Yep. So this is our constant current source right here, the main constant current source. In this case, uh, if we uh, 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 look at the values here of the resistor, uh, this is going to be giving us around 95 milliamps. It's a bit less than that uh, 100 milliamp that uh, we've calculated, but again, this is just for prototyping. I just wanted something that was close enough. Okay, in the final circuit, I'm going to change this resistor to something more appropriate. Appropriate. Okay. Now, if we look right here, we see again another constant current source. Okay, so we've identified two building blocks already. Now this means uh, this uh, 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 constant current source will be sourcing around uh, 3 
milliamps. Okay. Now we've identified two major building blocks. So we have a constant current source and we have a constant current sink. In this case, there are two sources, but this is just for the reference, as we see later. So where is our constant current sink? It is right here. It is just this uh, TIP32 transistor. Okay. This is what's going to be taking the grunt of the uh, uh, excess current that isn't going to load. Okay. And, uh, the way to identify that is very simple. As you can see here, all of these transistors, except for this one and this one, are uh, regular transistors. So they are all just your BC547s and the BC599s, uh, 559s. But only these two are actually power transistors. So that means that these two should be doing uh, the power regulation. Okay, That's one way to quickly identify this sort of stuff. Now, how is this whole thing working? First of all, since this is a constant current source, let's uh, just uh, ignore this transistor right here. That means that 3 milliamps should be, uh, has been uh, pushed into this node. So that means that our reference in this case was the red LED, as we discussed in the uh, previous video. We've uh, identified that the red LED would be the perfect source for this kind of circuit. Um, so it's getting around 3 milliamps from this, all right? This capacitor here is just some uh, decoupling to provide a uh, low impedance path to ground for AC. That's to improve the ripple. Same thing here and here. It's just decoupling. This is just to improve our uh, feedback network. Again, providing a low impedance path to ground for AC signals. Now, uh, how is this thing working? This thing's working with some negative feedback. If you look right here, we have this transistor that's driving this stage right here. So let me just put some voltages here just so the, the this makes a bit of sense. Let's say this is at uh, 12 volts. Okay. This is going to be at around like 1.8 volts because of the um, uh, forward voltage of the LED. The base of this transistor, it should be uh, 1 VB uh, above uh, this voltage right here. So let's say at uh, uh, 2.4 volts. That's reasonable. This is just your typical um, uh, emitter follower, okay? So you can think of that as just that, an emitter follower. And the way that this works is, yeah, disregard this uh, uh, potentiometer here. If we only look at this as if this was a short to this node right here, let's ignore it, just connect this to here, this node will have to be at 2.4 volts because at 2.4 volts this transistor will start to turn on and it will do everything it can to maintain that voltage here. It, it's going to destroy itself to maintain that voltage here at this node, okay? So the way that that will work is this is always sourcing that 3 milliamps, okay? The way a PNP transistor works is that current flows from its emitter to its base. It's, the, it's different from a... Uh, an NPN. In an NPN transistor, the uh, current flows through the base to the emitter. So the way to turn this on, the way that this is working, is by current and not by uh, voltage. So if we start drawing too much current through the base, so current flowing from the emitter to the base, this is going to turn on harder. If we stop uh, um, sinking current from the base, it will turn off. Okay. So this current sink, this current source is always sourcing current to this uh, to this reference, and what this transistor is doing is it's allowing that current to flow through here. Uh, but if we want, uh, if if it needs to turn this transistor on because this voltage is rising above again, let's just think that this is shorted to this node right here. If this tries to rise above that 2.5 volts, it will start to turn on harder. As soon as, turn on, as, soon that, as that uh, turns on harder, this 3 milliamps, this is just a constant current source. It can source, it is enabled source more than that 3 milliamps. So it has to uh, draw that current from somewhere. And that somewhere is the base of this transistor. As soon as that, this transistor pulls that excess current from this base, this turns on harder clamping the voltage right here by drawing uh, current through it, okay? 
This is a bit complicated because it's working with current and not voltage. We are used to uh, working with voltage, but you get the gist of it. So this transistor will do everything it can by pulling more current here, and uh, incidentally, pulling more current through the base of this transistor and uh, uh, making it conduct even further to maintain that 2.4 volts here. So if we wanted 2.4 volts here, we just tie this up to here and that's what we get. But we can put a potentiometer or just a, resistor, a resistive divider here that would give us uh, the voltage that we want here. The way to calculate that is very simple. It's just the voltage divider formula. You just get uh, the, your desired voltage. You plug that into the calculator. You have your output voltage. You need that 2.4 volts at the output of your voltage divider. And then you just solve for either the, the uh, R1, the top resistor, or to the bottom resistor. Okay, so that's very simple. In this case, just have a potentiometer so we can adjust that to anything we want. And by doing that, what happens is we get gain. Okay? So we're basically just multiplying this 1.8 volt supply here to this node right here. So as you can see, this circuit, it's not uh, uh, magic. It's not black magic. It's very simple stuff. Okay. Uh, the, the, again, the best way to look at it is just ignore this potentiometer and tie this up to here, making that, that node a uh, 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 2.4 volt node. Yeah. As soon as you understand the fact that uh, a PNP transistor conducts uh, uh, a greater amount of current here from the emitter to the collector, uh, as soon as you pull uh, current from its base, which is the uh, opposite of an NPN, it's very, you very quickly understand this sort of stuff. This is just sharing, this transistor is just sharing this uh, current flowing through here and current flowing through here. Okay, it's just syncing all that current. It's very simple. The more current it sinks, this can't uh, uh, provide more, so it has to come from somewhere. That somewhere will be this space right here. So that makes the circuit. It's, uh, <laughs> it's really simple. As soon as you uh, identify the building blocks you, and you understand the principle of operation of a PNP transistor like this. Just before you do the experiments, let me just say one thing. Um, this transistor here, it's not a, a, a good choice. I would have put a, a Darlington pair here just to minimize the amount of current flowing through here. Uh, in order to, because uh, again, remember, the more current that you pull through, through here, it all of it has to go through this uh, reference right here. And as we've discussed in the previous episode, this will change the current flowing through this uh, uh, reference, in this case, the LED, which in turn changes its forward voltage. Changing its forward voltage will change the reference, which will change the whole uh, feedback loop right here, which will induce a ripple at the output. So the only change that I would do here would be to uh, switch this for a TIP-125, which is the uh, Darlington equivalent of the TIP-32. That way we have less current flowing through here, less of a uh, current difference at our reference, making this circuit more stable and have less ripple. Okay. So now that we've um, discussed this, let's jump on over to some uh, experiments. Let's uh, actually see how this circuit fares. By the way, before we go, one thing that I forgot to mention, I made a, a mistake here with this circuit. And because uh, I've made a mistake here, I literally populated the wrong uh, uh, component here, but hey, let, that's just the way that things work. This um, capacitor here, which is uh, to improve the ripple response, uh, this is not a 100 uh, microfarad. This should be a 10 microfarad capacitor here, okay? So you can just either put a, a 10 microfarad capacitor here, or you can put a, uh, let's say, for a nominal value, a 22 microfarad capacitor here and put another uh, 22 microfarad capacitor here. Let's say like this, 22 micro and this a 22 micro. Okay. That way um, we get all the benefits of a uh, less ripple because we have a, uh, um, a lower uh, a lower impedance path to ground for AC uh, voltages, right? This way with the second capacitor is even better because then we have a really direct path to ground for those uh, signals. Otherwise, they will have to go either to this resistor here or to the base of this uh, 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 NPN transistor. 
which is not ideal. So this way you get a really nice low impedance to run by putting the two capacitors. But again, you got to remember to get the same uh, 10 microfarads, you have to put a 22 and a 22 because they are effectively in series for AC signals. Okay. Uh, the way that this works, uh, the, the greater the capacitor that you put here, the more your circuit will have that uh, RC time constant because it will be uh, charging this capacitor. In this case, if you don't have this right here, through the uh, lower part of this potentiometer, which makes it uh, extremely slow because this is going to be at a, a fairly high um, uh, impedance. You can put, for example, in this case, I put a 100K uh, uh, a trimmer because that's all I had. But if you put, for example, a 10K trimmer here, that would be even better because then you get a, a much lower impedance here. And the problem is that the greater this capacitor is, the slower this circuit takes to charge up. So this voltage will just sag and it will take, let's say, uh, five seconds or even sometimes more than five seconds to get the, the desired voltage of, uh, let's say, 12 volts. There is also another problem. When this capacitor is here, uh, as soon as you try to change this uh, potentiometer value, what happens is that it is fighting this capacitor here because it has to charge that capacitor first. So you adjust and then you have to wait and wait and wait until the, it charges up so that you get a, a steady voltage here. One, one way to mitigate that is again to reduce the value of both the potentiometer and the um, capacitor. Uh, and also, uh, one good thing is if you really want, you can just put a jumper here so that uh, in this case if you put the two capacitors you have to put one jumper here and one here so that you can take out that jumper adjust the the your output voltage from with the potentiometer that way you don't have to wait for these capacitors to charge up you always get that steady uh, output voltage that you want and as soon as you are um, comfortable with the way that it is and you've set it to what the value that you want you then just pull the jumpers back into place and now these capacitors are in circuit and they will charge up and do what they have to do okay so just a, a little addendum there just keep that in mind okay now let's jump on over to the actual experiments so i've rearranged the bench i've uh connected the regulator up and i've also connected it to my uh electronic dc load for us to do some tests Right now, the load is uh, completely off. So, uh, the way that this is, is the worst case scenario. This, uh, uh, this transistor here, Q6, the, uh, our shunt transistor, is taking all the, the grunt of the work and it is dissipating all those uh, almost 12 volts at uh, 91 milliamps. So, this uh, uh, multimeter here, it's measuring the current here in JP1 flowing through the transistor. So this is measuring how much our uh, current is, uh, our, how much our circuit is uh, shunting that current. So basically what we are doing here, we are measuring this I2 right here. Okay. As we've discussed, this is how a shunt regulator works. So um, first of all, since this is uh, operating at its worst case possible, uh, let's do some uh, some quick measurements of our temperature. Sorry for the rainbow in fact, that's just a polarizing filter. So let's check that uh, first transistor, the one for the uh, current source. So it is at uh, around uh, 36, 37, let's say 40 uh, degrees C. That's perfectly acceptable. That's uh, a, a great um, temperature, no problems there whatsoever. This transistor doesn't even need a heatsink, to be honest. Uh, in the final design, I'm probably just going to put a, a heatsink, or maybe not. I, I don't think I will put a heatsink on it, because it's just uh, superfluous to do that. This is just running in a, per, in a perfectly acceptable state. Now, this is going to be a very different uh, beast. So this is Q6, the uh, actual shunt transistor, and it's going to be running very hot in this case. Let's see how, how far it climbs. This circuit, by the way, it's uh, turned on for like the best of two or three minutes. So it has had time to, uh, <laughs> to, to heat up. Um, let's say this, uh, this can get to 75, maybe 80 degrees C. Okay. 
Remember above temperature, above a uh, ambient. Uh, if you are ambient uh, temperature, in this case, I think we are at uh, 21 degrees. Um, remember that uh, the greater your ambient temperature, the hotter this thing will get. But uh, the thing is, this will definitely need a heatsink on it. Okay, this is just we need to heatsink this one. Now, uh, remember that the more current withdraw from the circuit, the shunt regulator works in it, uh, a bit backwards, the more current that we draw from this circuit, the um, colder it will run. So it's a bit backwards from the way that we, uh, that we think. Usually we deal with a series uh, linear regulators and in those circuits, the more current you draw, the hotter it gets, right? In this case, it's the opposite. So, let's do some experiments. Here we have the uh, DC load. I have it connected to my uh, HP, HP 8904A synthesizer. That way we get a, a very nice, stable DC voltage here. Very precise as well. It's currently turned off. So, watch out for uh, this current right here and see how much it will change. I'm going to be applying a uh, uh, 20 milliamp load to the circuit. So, as we've discussed previously, remember this stuff? I'm drawing this uh, uh, load here. It's drawing exactly 20 milliamps. And as we see, the uh, current here passing through this shunt transistor here, this one, the one that was hot, dropped exactly that amount, that 20 milliamps. That means that the theory is correct and it works. Okay? So what it is doing is it's trying to keep the voltage at the output here constant by changing the um, amount of uh, a current that it is trying to shunt. Okay? So if we increase that, let's say, to uh, 40 milliamps, okay, again, we see that a uh, uh, current change there. Okay? If we increase that, let's say, let's go for... Um, Let's do 80, okay, so 80 uh, milliamps, do you see? That drops once again. So yeah, uh, this is a, a very simple circuit in the DC standpoint. It works just as we expected, okay? And when you look at this, this is a first fight, it's a bit daunting, but as soon as you understand how the circuit works, it's pretty uh, uh, simple. Again, now if we touch this transistor here, it's a, a, just a little bit warm to the touch, it's dissipating almost nothing, and as soon as I touch it, it's already just getting cold, because it's uh, heat sinking into my fingers. So yeah, again, that's a, a negative temperature thing. Now, this isn't the most important part, as we've discussed previously, the most important thing is the ripple at the output, because our uh, uh, amplifier circuit, since it's uh, all uh, about uh, minimalism, it uh, doesn't have the best power supply rejection ratio. So we need to make sure that this circuit, when operating with a uh, dynamic load, can uh, maintain a stable voltage at the output that won't, uh, be, that won't have any ripple. So let's test that in, we use in the oscilloscope and this uh, DC load right here with an AC source, okay? So I'll have to rearrange the bench and uh, I'll see you there. Oh, by the way, as you see, like this voltage changed. The, the, the way that uh, this, uh, the reason why this is changing is again, that fact that uh, we have more current now flowing through here because it's flowing through here, going to the emitter, to the base. That's how a PNP transistor works. And it's being shunted by that transistor, the Q5, which means that the current here for the LED is changing. So it's forward voltage is changing, okay? And that's why we see this uh, uh, change in output voltage here. The way to mitigate that is to use, again, a Darlington here. That way there is less current flowing through the base of it and less current being changed here at the uh, uh, our reference node, all right? So that's the only reason why this is changing. And again, I've already provided the way to mitigate that. Just put a Darlington here and it will just work, okay? Now, let me rearrange the bench and I'll see you there, okay? So I've rearranged the bench. Now we are ready to um, perform some uh, measurements. 
This looks like a mess, of course, as usual. Hey, when you're uh, probing stuff, it, it never looks great. Um, so let me uh, walk you through the setup here. Okay, so same thing as before. We have it connected to the DC load. This is going to the oscilloscope, not the uh, multimeter, because we want to look at AC signals. The load here, it's now uh, tied up to my uh, RIGO DG1022A. So this is just set up. We are going to be uh, uh, applying uh, some AC here with a DC offset, is, of course. Now, let's take a look here at the oscilloscope. So what we have here, first of all, this trace right here, the yellow one, it's in channel one, and that is the, uh, the channel that's monitoring the output of the, the uh, regulator. Okay, the, it's AC couple, remember? Uh, the green trace here, channel two, that one is this probe right here that is connected across the uh, sense resistors. Okay, and this one is DC couple so that you can see the offset, right? So, uh, what do we have in here? Oh, first of all, since here in this trace right here, the ch at channel one, we are measuring down at uh, uh, two millivolts per division. You got to keep some uh, uh, very important things in mind because at that, uh, those types of uh, uh, voltages, the noise just overwhelms the input of the, the oscilloscope. So first of all, you need to do some uh, averaging. In this case, I'm just doing some, uh, some eight averages. Okay. This is just some, uh, some good tips for you if you uh, are a beginner and you don't know how to, uh, to do these sorts of measurements. So if, we, if we turn off the, the averaging, it gets like it gets even worse. Let me just turn off everything. So I also have bandwidth limiting. Okay, it's on. It gets even worse. You can see if I turn that off, and I also have a digital filter. Oh, by the way, I'm applying a uh, one kilohertz signal. And uh, if I turn that filter off, this is what you get. This is just undecipherable. Okay, you just can't do any uh, meaningful measurements on this. So what you do is just uh, uh, set up your filter. Okay. Uh, and you put some uh, bandwidth limiting, and you also put some average in, okay? Then you get a clean signal. This is actually what you want. All the rest is just noise that's then being uh, picked up uh, from your bench, your lighting, and stuff like that. And you don't care about that. Your circuit's not going to be seeing that sort of noise. This is what your circuit's actually seeing. That noise is just induced by the fact that you basically have a great antenna here. Now. Those are just some uh, tips for you to measure this sort of uh, uh, low level signals, okay? Now, oh, by the way, this only works if your signal was repetitive like this. Uh, if your signal was, let's say, something that you want to catch a transient or stuff like that, this just won't work because the averaging and all that, it just won't work, all right? Now, so what we have here is, um, we have a DC offset of uh, 45 millivolts, which means that we have uh, 45 milliamps flowing continuously through it, just so that we are at the middle of those uh, uh, 90 milliamps that the circuit is providing. Then I am applying a 10 millivolts peak to peak sine wave through it. And that 10 millivolts means, let's just go with saying about current. So I'm applying a uh, 10 milliamp dynamic load through it, like this. And that's giving us around a 2 millivolts peak to peak. Of ripple at the output, which is hey acceptable, but let's dial that up. If we go to two, uh, 20 milliamps of a uh, ripple uh, of current ripple at the output of a uh, draw in the output, we've doubled the ripple of the output voltage. If we go to 30, same thing again, it has tripled. So we are seeing a pattern here. The ripple voltage at the output is linear regarding with load ripple, okay? So let's just go for the worst case scenario, which is to have um, around, let's, let's not bottom it out, okay? Let's go for a 85 milliamps. Let's go a bit higher. Let's go 88 milliamps, okay? So we have 88 milliamps, let me do this, okay? So we have 88 millivolts, also, uh, uh, 88 milliamps peak to peak. Uh, in this case, we have almost 20 millivolts peak to peak of swing at the output, which is, hey, it's not ideal, 
but it is pretty good for a simple circuit like this. Okay. This will affect a bit our uh, amplifier, but that's not a, a, a very uh, disastrous thing. Okay. Remember that this is the worst case scenario. This would be a, a, a let's say, an example of using the, the 16 ohm load at the output of the headphone amplifier. So the reason that I want to go with the dual mono is because of this, okay? Because this, if we had two channels pulling the, the, a similar thing like this, you would probably have some crosstalk because they are sharing the same um, regulator. If you split the regulators, one for one channel and one for the other, they can't interfere with each other via the power supply, okay? So that's just a, uh, uh, something that I decided to go with. Now, this voltage swing is happening here because of those, uh, that change in current through the LED because uh, the transistor that's driving it is pulling current from the base of the uh, shunt transistor. Again, we can minimize this. If, uh, by the way, we've already minimized it by uh, adding those two capacitors that we've talked about, both the capacitor at the, um, at the air reference and the capacitor across the, the, feedback, ne the feedback network. But we can in, uh, improve this even further by changing that uh, uh, Q6 by a Darlington PNP. Okay, so keep that in mind. As soon as you change that for a Darlington, this is going to go down, right? Because of the stuff that we talked about previously uh, with the current changing at the uh, reference. Now, this is at one kilohertz, okay? Let's change this a bit. Let's take a look at it again. I'm going to stay with this uh, uh, signal. Let's go for a frequency of 20 kilohertz, okay? So at 20 kilohertz, as you can see, we have around uh, 13 millivolts peak to peak at the output of swing. So the greater the current, the, the frequency, less ripple we get as well. So this is at the top end. Now let's go to the bottom end. Let's go to 20 hertz. At 20 hertz, what we get is a bit different. So first of all, the, <laughs> the um, waveform changes. It doesn't look like a, a sine wave anymore. But we've increased a bit of our, um, uh, our ripple. At the output, we have uh, around 25 millivolts to peak. But hey, that's perfectly acceptable. We're not getting uh, some wild divergencies. Like for example, if this was at a uh, uh, 50 or 60 millivolts, this is pretty uh, okay because we are applying a lot of filtering. So that's great. So our circuit is working phenomenally well. Okay, and it, it has some room for improvement. We should uh, change that for Darlington. I don't have any here, so I can change it right now. But in the final circuit, I'm going to change it, and this uh, will be much better. So when we get to that final circuit and it's all built up, we can redo all of these uh, measurements and uh, test um, how it performs then. Um, I'm going to end this here. Let me just uh, rearrange the bench, clean it all up, and, and then we can end this video. Okay, so let me do just that. So this was a, quite a nice circuit to design. It is a very minimal circuit and it performs uh, quite well. Again, it's not perfect, but it's more than acceptable for what we are uh, using it for. I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, here, it's a, it's a very good uh, building block for uh, any sort of uh, uh, regulator that you might want to design. Hope you've uh, learned a lot by this. Um, Again, since the regulator is, uh, is finished, now we are going to start looking into the actual uh, power supply, uh, the transformer, rectifier, capacitor selection, and all that to minimize the input ripple for the circuit. Uh, by the way, one thing that I haven't mentioned before, uh, down in the description of the video, you have a link to the GitHub page of this project where I've um, put all of these uh, designs here so that if you want, you can print them out at home and uh, I'll start it up yourself. I also have these uh, schematics available there. And also one thing that's very good, I have the simulations in LT Spy so that you can simulate the circuit, you can uh, change the, the values and play around with that and learn more, which is great. And great way to learn more 
is to do simulations because in simulation you can just play around with it however you want. You can just pass a huge amount of huge amount of uh, current through it. You can just very quickly uh, change the circuit up and test stuff out. Always remember that the simulation is not perfect. Okay, it doesn't reflect uh, what's going to happen in the real world, but it gives you a pretty good um, estimation of how things are going to work. So that's all there as well. Now, I hope you've enjoyed this one. Um, the next few videos are going to be a very uh, practical and a bit theoretical as well, but a uh, very practical and stuff that you use to, uh, uh, that you can apply for to literally any sort of circuit that you design, stuff like transformers, rectifiers, and the uh, filter capacitors. So uh, I hope you've enjoyed this one. I hope you stick around for the next one. If you have any suggestions, any feedback, or any questions, please leave them in the comments below. This was it. And, uh, Hope to see you in the next one. Uh, yeah, so bye for now.